Welcome to Literary Genius. In this lesson, we shall try to analyze the poem, To the Memory of Mr. Oldham, written by John Dryden. I would like to start off with a short introduction into the Restoration Period. What is Restoration Period? This is the period when the British monarchy was reinstated. In 1660 to be precise. The period was marked by intense political turmoil. In terms of literature, the period was referred to as the Age of Dryden. Why the Age of Dryden? Because, John Dryden was considered the greatest poet during this period. John Dryden was a famous satirist. Due to his mastery, Dryden was made England's first poet laureate, in 1668. Now, let's focus on the poem we're going to study. To the memory of Mr. Oldham. This will be a short introduction to the poem. We will start off with the genre, because, the genre has a direct correlation with the main idea of the poem. We call this poem an elegy. I will discuss about elegy in detail in the following slide. The poem is written in 1684. It is about the untimely death of John Oldham. John Oldham is an English poet, who experienced a premature death, in his thirties. Similar to Dryden, Oldham was a satirist, and explored the religious and political discontent, and turmoil, in the contemporary England. Now, I will return to our discussion about an elegy. What is an elegy? An elegy is a poem or song, that expresses sadness, especially for someone who has died. The elegy was originated in Greek. The structure of an elegy is threefold. Expression of grief, the admiration of the person who died, and the consolation, or realization of the loss. However, this poem contains only two aspects. The expression of grief, and the admiration of the person who died. When you read the elegy, you will understand that Dryden's expression of grief is moderate and measured. Measured means controlled. Now, it is high time we begin to analyze the poem, isn't it? For the ease of your reference, I have broken the poem down into several sections. The poem, however, is not segmented into separate stanzas. In this slide, we will look at the first four lines. Farewell, too little, and too lately known. Whom I began to think, and call my own. For sure, our souls, were near allied. And thine? Cast in the same poetic mould, with mine. The first thing that we notice, is the dramatic opening, with the poet bidding farewell to Oldham. Filled with emotion, the opening takes on a conversational style. Basically, the opening is dramatic, because, you feel that the poet is acting than writing. The first and the second lines develop a contrast. In the first line, the poet says, that he knew Oldham very little. But, in the second line, he says, that he has become a part of the poet's life. How is it possible for a person to become a part of your life when you barely know him? This is the contrast we were talking about. An interesting question to ask yourself would be, what kind of an effect does this contrast have on the poem? We An interesting question to ask yourself would be, what kind of an effect does this contrast have on the poem? We could also detect an interesting metaphor in the last two lines. The poet uses the act of casting two similar things as a metaphor to signify the similarity between their poetic inclinations. What is casting? Look at the picture to understand what casting means. Accordingly, Oldham's soul is molded in the same way as a Dryden. Great job. Now let's focus on the second part. One common note on either lyre did strike. And knaves and fools we both abhorred alike. To the same goal did both our studies drive. The last set out the soonest did arrive. Wow. Another metaphor. Dryden now equates them to two lyres that play the same musical note. Lyre is a musical instrument, as seen in the picture. So, what does this mean to us? It again highlights the similarity between their poetic inclinations. They are basically like two lyres playing the same tune. 
Using these two metaphors, Dryden highlights the following qualities that he has in common with Oldham. Both of them were satirists, who explored the social, political, and religious turmoil in England. They also abhorred knaves, and fools. Both of them are satirists, who attempted to reform social foibles. You're doing pretty good. Now, let's focus on the next section of the poem. Hold on tight, because we're traveling back in time. Sounds exciting, isn't it? In this section, we are going to explore ancient Greek mythology. Before we take the plunge, let's read the poem out loud. Thus Nigeus fell upon the slippery place, while his young friend performed and won the race. O oh, early ripe, to thy abundant store, what could advancing age have added more? So, what do we call when a writer refers to an event from Greek mythology? We call it an allusion. When one text refers to another text in an indirect way, we call it an allusion. This particular mythology revolves around the story of Nigeus and Darius. Long, long ago, presumably in Greek, Nigeus and Darius took part in a race. Nigeus was about to win when he slipped. This gave a chance to Aurelius to become the victor. Whether Nigeus did it on purpose is a moot point. So, why is Dryden using such an illusion? He is making a comparison between Aurelius and Oldham. In the previous section, Dryden claimed, the last one to begin was the soonest to arrive. Who was the soonest to arrive? Oldham. Oldham is the first to complete his life. Like Aurelius, Oldham's death is more like a victory, because he completed his mission sooner than Dryden. Oldham's death, therefore, is seen in a positive light, as a fulfillment of his mission. Apart from the illusion, we could detect an interesting metaphor. Dryden equates Oldham to a tree full of fruits. These fruits are metaphoric of his poetic skills. These fruits have grown ripe too early, suggesting that he reached the peak of poetic skills at a young age. The early ripe could also mean the early death, or rather, the early completion of his life. Remember, Dryden does not portray his death in a negative manner. This is a unique feature in the elegy, because death is treated as a negative force in many poems, especially in elegies. The poet uses a rhetorical question in the last line. Dryden wonders, what else could have been achieved, even if Oldham lived long? This implies that Oldham has already perfected the art of writing poetry. And there is nothing left to achieve. Congratulations! You successfully completed the section. Now, without further delay, let's move on to the next portion. It might, what nature never gives the young, have taught the numbers of thy native tongue. But satire needs not those, and wit will shine through the harsh cadence of a rugged line. Let's assume Oldham lived long. What could he have learnt? According to Dryden, if Oldham lived longer, he could only learn the technical aspects of writing poetry, such as the meter and structure. These are things that you learn by experience. They have nothing to do with talent. In other words, they are not given to you by nature. But, says Dryden, wit will shine through harsh rhythm of a harsh line. In other words, wit is more about talent, not about technicality. Wit simply means the ability to sail, or write things that are both clever and amusing. Satire is a way of criticizing a person, an idea, or an institution, using humor and wit to show their faults or weaknesses. What's the difference between satire and wit? Wit is not necessarily used to criticize something, but satire is. We're almost there. So keep listening. A noble error, and but seldom made. When poets are, by too much force betrayed, thy generous fruits, though gathered ere their prime, still showed a quickness, and maturing time, but mellows what we write to the dull sweets of rhyme. Did anyone detect an oxymoron? Yes, we did. Wait. What is an oxymoron? Oxymoron is a phrase containing two opposite words, that make it seem impossible or unlikely, although it is probably true. Look at the picture. When you tell someone that they have clearly misunderstood, 
or when you try to act naturally, when talking to a pretty girl or a good-looking boy, or when you read in the newspaper that someone was found missing, or when you find a joke seriously funny, or even when your pet makes a mess, which could look pretty ugly. All these are examples of oxymoron. We could detect an oxymoron in the first line itself. Noble error. We hardly associate nobility with error. They seem contradicting to one another. However, the poet uses this to convey a particular quality of the young writer. Young writers write with too much force, that sometimes, they almost forget to comply with poetic conventions. It is noble to express yourself with such force, vitality, and energy, although you go against poetic conventions in doing so. The third line contains a metaphor. Oldham is portrayed as a tree full of ripe fruits. You may recall this tree metaphor, when he used it to suggest his early fulfillment of life. He called it, early ripe. In these lines, Oldham is portrayed as a tree, whose fruits are plucked before their due time. Quickness refers to the quality of being able to achieve something before the due time. Fruits, on the other hand, are metaphoric of his poetic skills. The word, pluck, The word, pluck, suggests the influence of an external force. There should be someone to pluck the fruits, isn't that so? The force, at this point, could be death. Dryden is saying that although death stopped Oldham, before his skills could reach their optimum, he was still able to achieve great poetic skill. However, this is not to say that mature poets are perfect in their writing. Dryden highlights a disadvantage of maturity. When poets grow mature, their poetry lose their vigor, and become dull. We're almost done. Now it is time to analyze the last bit of the poem. Once more, hail and farewell. Farewell thou young. But art too short, Marcellus of our tongue. Thy brows with ivy, and with laurels bound. But fate, and gloomy night encompass thee around. In the first line we could observe the juxtaposition of opposites. Hail and farewell. We wouldn't normally say hi and bye at the same time, would we? This juxtaposition serves a special purpose. It highlights the short duration of their acquaintance, or the brevity of Oldham's life. Allusion to classical history. Look at the second line. Marcellus is the nephew of the Emperor Augustus. He was the successor of Roman Empire. You may recall the previous example of allusion from Greek mythology. This time, it is an allusion to classical history. In this line, Dryden views Oldham as the successor of the literary empire of Britain. Using the allusion, Dryden establishes the important role played by Oldham in the literary realm of Britain. Notice that Dryden has used several polarities throughout the poem, such as Nicius and Darius, Augustus and Marcellus, and of course, Dryden and Oldham. These polarities indicate a subtle power hierarchy at work. Symbolism. According to Dryden, Oldham wears ivy and laurels. Ivy is the symbol of eternity and strong affection, such as love and friendship. Laurels are symbolic of victory. Using these symbols, Dryden says, although Oldham died, his name will be loved and remembered forever. There are some important and interesting themes in this elegy. Death is seen as a universal truth, experienced by human beings, irrespective of their race, class, gender, or creed. The lasting value of an artist, and his or her works. The unity among artists, despite a healthy competition. There you have it. An analysis of the elegy, to the memory of Mr. Oldham. Hope you enjoyed.